Hi right, guys, welcome to this video on the functions of the cardiovascular system. We're going to start off by looking at uh, the composition of blood and then when we've done that we'll look at five things that the cardiovascular system is supposed to do. So composition of blood first. Um, what's important to note about blood is that it's made up of a bunch of different components um, and those components have distinct roles. They each are designed or intended to do different things within the cardiovascular system. Um, and the volumes of each, although I'm going to give you some kind of ballpark figures, roughly percentage comp components for, for each of these composition overall, um, they can actually change. Um, and the volumes might go up or down depending on uh, the type of training that you do and also your general health levels as well. Um, um, and I'll explain more about that as we go along. So what is blood made up of? Um, well, the first thing, obviously, is that it's got red blood cells in it. Um, and red blood cells, um, or haemoglobin, accounts for about 41% of the overall volume of blood. And the purpose of the red blood cells, of course, is to bind with oxygen and to carry that oxygen around to where it's needed. That, that's its main function. And the red blood cells, as you know, uh, are made in the bone marrow and then uh, can respond to certain hormones uh, to produce more red blood cells. So when we do lots of aerobic exercise, for example, re we release a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO that causes us to release more red blood cells. And so the red blood cell count, um, which is also known as the hematocrit, is going to go up. But overall, in terms of its composition, blood tends to have around about 41% red blood cells. After this, we've got white blood cells and platelets. And we'll talk about what their roles are in just a moment. Um, but about 4% of the overall composition of blood is made up of white blood cells and platelets. And platelets are just bits of old cells, bits of cellular debris and so on. Um, and again, I'll explain what they're for in just a minute. And then finally, plasma. So plasma is a sort of a, a, a faint yellowish liquid um, that is the stuff that the rest of the blood is kind of suspended in, I guess. Uh, helps maintain a level of um, thickness to the blood uh, that's required at the right level to ensure that the blood flows adequately and that the white blood cells, the platelets and the red blood cells are carried around effectively. And plasma accounts for just over half of the overall composition of blood, about 55%. But interestingly, it can go up and down as well, um, depending on levels of hydration. So if you're really well hydrated, your plasma levels will be about 55%. But as soon as you become dehydrated, whether that's through sport or simply not drinking enough water or not having enough water intake for whatever reason, um, maybe it's a really hot day or something, um, the plasma levels will start to drop. And as they do drop, it's going to mean that the blood becomes thicker and then the heart's got to work harder to get the blood pumped around because the pressure increases and so on. So plasma is a really important um, component of blood. Let's think about then five things that the blood is supposed to do, um, five of its functions. The first function of blood, the first function of the cardiovascular system is the delivery of oxygen and nutrients. So oxygen is needed for cellular respiration. Uh, it's breathed in obviously via the lungs, binds with the red blood cells that are being brought along to the alveoli and then is carried around the, the whole body system to where it's needed. So for example to the muscles where it's dropped off and is there, therefore available for cellular respiration, the production of energy um, for exercise in our, in our case. Nutrients um, are derived from the food that we eat. And so there's a whole raft of different kinds of nutrients that the blood is responsible for carrying to where it's needed. So that might include, for example, blood glucose. And that comes from the carbohydrate sources that we eat, broken down and then is released into the blood. And the blood glucose levels uh, the body tries to maintain glucose levels by either putting glucose in or taking it out and storing it um, at any given time to try and maintain blood glucose levels at a sensible level, at a homeostatic level. Um, from, our, from our protein intake, we have amino acids, which are really useful for um, rebuilding damaged tissue and so on. Um, we also have fatty acids um, in the bloodstream that are derived from the fats that we eat in particular, um, which again can be useful as an energy source provided there's adequate 
um, oxygen and also uh, a good way of storing additional fat that we might need some other time. Um, and then vitamins and minerals, of course, are all essential. We won't get into the details of that, except to say that vitamins and minerals are also carried uh, by the blood in the bloodstream. The second um, feature then, the second function of the cardiovascular system is the removal of waste products. And so the first and most important waste product that we want to get rid of out of our system as far as um, sport and exercise is concerned is as a result of aerobic respiration, we want to get rid of carbon dioxide. So that carbon dioxide that is produced as we exercise aerobically, um, that carbon dioxide is dissolved in the blood. Um, it might be converted into uh, something else or just exhaled. Um, obviously the blood needs to carry that carbon dioxide to the lungs in order for it to be exhaled. Um, also in aerobic respiration, we produce excess water. Um, and if we have no need for that excess water, so the uh, water levels are too high, then that water is removed from the bloodstream via the kidneys uh, and then is excreted thereafter. From anaerobic respiration, however, we have different waste products. Um, we're, for now, for sake of argument, we're going to refer to lactate as a waste product. Technically, you could argue it's not a waste product because it's still useful in the system. Um, but it is a let's just let's just say it's a byproduct in this case, uh, and that byproduct needs to be um, taken out of the muscular. Um, out of the muscular system and removed to be processed somewhere else. And that, that is done by the bloodstream. So the bloodstream takes that lactate, it's taken to the liver uh, where it can be processed and then returned to glycogen and stored. A third function then of the cardiovascular system is thermoregulation. And this is a role that all the components play together as a whole. Thermoregulation simply means maintaining of body temperature so that we don't get too cold, we don't get too hot. And the way that we do this, um, well, there are multiple ways we do this, but specifically within the cardiovascular system, the main way we do this is by redirecting blood flow. So we redirect blood flow to manage our body temperature. So, for example, if we are too warm and our core temperature is rising, we might redirect blood flow to the skin so that um, the skin becomes warm and we can lose heat via radiation from the skin. There are other things that we can do as well, sweating and so on, but that doesn't necessarily fall under the heading of the cardiovascular system. Alternatively, if we're too cold and we're at risk, uh, risk of death, basically, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, we would try and maintain our core temperature by redirecting all the blood that's flowing around the body away from the extremities to the vital organs. So we need to we need to have some way of getting blood to flow where we would like it to flow. And that's done by vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Now, under normal circumstances, um, as blood is flowing through the system, through the blood vessels, um, there is not much restriction to that blood flow, generally speaking. Now, if we want to, if we're in a position where we would like to divert blood either to or from a particular area of the body, we will either open up the blood vessels to allow more blood to flow through or we will close them down. Now, opening up the blood vessels is called vaso dilation so dilation means to get wider vaso means to do with the vessel so the vessels just get wider so in the example where we where our core temperature is too high and we need blood to flow to the skin um, so that it can heat up the skin and then the skin can lose heat via radiation what we'll do is the blood vessels that would normally have normal flow through them as you can see on the diagram on the left those blood vessels that are nearer the skin will dilate so they'll get wider so that more blood can flow closer to the skin. So we'll have vasodilation in the skin or close to the skin. And that will help us maintain a sensible, a level body temperature, the body temperature that we require. The opposite is also true, though. If we need to maintain core temperature and we're at risk of getting too cold, for example, and we need to maintain the function of our of our uh, maintain our core function we need to maintain um, the working of our uh, vital organs we might want to stop the blood from flowing too close to the skin because we're losing heat 
And in those instances, we will do something called vasoconstriction, where the blood vessels close down and allow a lot less blood to flow through them. So it becomes harder for the blood to flow to the skin. And so it, it tends to maintain its location closer to the core. So this is the way, this vasodilation, where the vessels get bigger, vasoconstriction, where they get smaller, is a way of um, the body shutting down certain areas or redirecting blood flow to where it's needed, whether or not that means we want to warm up or cool down. It just depends on where we're sending the blood to. A fourth function of the cardiovascular system, um, the role of blood essentially, is to fight infection. And this particularly is a role for the white blood cells. Now the, the proper name for a white blood cell is a leukocyte, a leukocyte, and they are produced in the bone marrow. What do they do? So as the heading suggests, they fight infection. So initially, um, a leukocyte will locate a pathogen and a pathogen is anything in the system that might cause illness. The leukocytes will locate pathogens, particularly within the bloodstream or anywhere in the body, and then will use the bloodstream to get to that pathogen. So it's almost the transport system for our white blood cells. It's the way that they get to where the potential illness or the potential disease is located. And when they get there, they kind of surround and destroy from the outside in, they'll destroy that pathogen, whatever it might be, whether it's a, a bacterium or a virus or whatever, they'll consume it. Um, and having done so, they will produce, these white blood cells, these leukocytes will produce antibodies, um, which are which remain in the, in the system. Um, and the body remembers how to create these antibodies so that next time it, uh, the same pathogen arrives, this antibody can be produced that will go straight to that pathogen and break it down and destroy it. And that's kind of one of the key ways our immune system works. Um, and also the um, leukocytes will produce antitoxins. Um, so a pathogen, a virus or something might produce toxins um, and release those toxins into the bloodstream, which might then damage um, the organs. So the antibodies that are produced will break down the pathogen the antitoxins will break down any toxins produced by the pathogen. So basically serving the same function of keeping us healthy. And that's what leukocytes do. So that's the fourth role of um, blood in the cardiovascular system is to fight infection. And it's the white blood cells that do that. Finally, then, in terms of functions of the cardiovascular system, we've got blood clotting. Um, so when um, a vessel, a blood vessel is damaged, whether it's an artery, a capillary, a vein, when it's damaged um, and, and broken, there is contact between the blood and the collagen fibres that normally surround the, the blood vessel. Under normal circumstances, the blood doesn't have contact with that collagen fibre. And so what happens is that the platelets that are in the blood, which we mentioned previously, begin to stick to those exposed collagen fibres. And that doesn't normally happen. They don't, they don't normally become sticky in that way. The next thing after this in the process of blood clotting is that the platelets themselves having become sticky, so they stick to the collagen fibers and then they themselves become sticky, they form a plug over where the damage was caused. After this, um, a clotting factor, um, fibrinogen in the plasma causes a mesh to form. And that mesh is made of something called fibrin and it covers over the platelet plug um, and the mesh itself becomes sticky just like the platelets are so we've got this platelet plug that's sticky then we've got this fibrin mesh covering over the the location of the damage and the next thing that occurs is that red blood cells and more platelets get trapped in that mesh so it's building up, sticking to where the damage was caused and building up and, and more red blood cells getting wedged in the mesh until that mesh covers over the entirety of the damaged area. Once that is done, we've, we can say that we have formed a clot. So that's how blood clotting works based on all the stuff that's floating around already in the blood. As soon as those collagen fibers that are normally outside the vessel are exposed, this process occurs to block the hole and give time for healing to occur. 
eventually once the um, once the vessel itself has, has healed the clot begins to be washed away so that's it for functions of the cardiovascular system i hope that's been helpful to you thanks for watching see you in the next video